So last time, of course, we talked about the, um, the angels in the ascension and the angels in the church. <coughs> Today, <coughs> we're going to talk about the role of the angels in the sacraments and the liturgy. Now, we won't cover all seven sacraments. We're going to mainly focus on, the bap on baptism and Eucharist and, and the liturgy. So uh, you'll, you'll, we'll, we'll limit you know, the discussion to those because our, our author, um, you know, Don, Cardinal Don Ailu, where the, these notes that I'm giving you today largely come from, the angels and their mission. And you can see it's not a big book. You ought to have a copy and uh, go sell all you have and buy one. All right, now, um, we begin <coughs> with a couple of premises. And one, the first premise is just to link to last week's material about the ascension, but that in the ascension, the word, Jesus, leads humanity, which he has united himself, into the very house, into the very inner sanctum, the holy of holies of his father. And the angels wondered at this, and they were amazed. Um, so we see that was last week's material. Now, this reality of Christ seated at the Father's right hand and dispensing graces to us um, has now to put forth its effects until the second coming. And the Lord does this largely through the sacraments, through his word, and through the liturgy. Um, and so we see that um, uh, this needs to take place. Now, somebody, uh, I, get, I sometimes get questions like this. You say, Father, that mystically I'm already at the Father's right hand if I'm a member of the body of Christ, because we're, where the head goes, the body goes. But how is that? Because I'm down here and he's up there. And I, I, I've told some of you this before, but, you know, yesterday morning I got a, I went down to the radio station and I punched the elevator button for the 11th floor. Now, the top of my head got to the 11th floor before the soles of my feet, but the point is I got there, okay? And um, so that al although Christ has ascended, in a mystical sense, he's also ascending still in us, but he's there, and as long as we're with him, we are mystically there as well. But nevertheless, there is a reality that we still need those graces to keep us united to his body so that where he is now, we also will be fully in experiencing it. So this is necessary then that through the sacraments, through the liturgy, through Holy Scripture, and by extension, Holy Fellowship with both Christ and all the members of his body, that we will uh, be given the graces uh, to get there with Christ. Now, how do how, the, these sacraments, the liturgy, the scripture, through all of these things, the, uh, the, the angels are ministering these effects. They are very deeply involved in every aspect of all the sacraments, uh, of the liturgy, certainly, and um, even, even of the word of God and so on. Now, with that in mind, let me give you a couple of scriptures. Well, one scripture um, and we, we see regarding the angels, and, and their role in sanctifying and helping us to stay close to Christ. From Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 14, we see this. Are they not all ministering angels sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? So already there we have a key text that says, whatever is necessary for us to inherit salvation, the, the angels are ministering spirits sent to bring us these graces and draw us up uh, by God's grace. Uh, to the heavenly realities, okay? Now, uh, there's a little reference here, and we'll probably refer to it later as well, in the Roman canon, just to see one example of the angel's ministry in, in, in uh, the liturgy. Uh, in the Roman canon, the priest says this, In humble prayer we ask you, Almighty God, command that these gifts be borne by the hands of your holy angel to your altar on high in the sight of your divine majesty. Now, some argue that that holy angel is Christ himself. But others, like most of the fathers of the church, see this, though, as simply the uh, reference to the fact that the angels minister uh, the graces that, that come forth in, in the liturgy. They are not the cause, but they, they, if you will, are the conduit, the way in which God ministers, much as the air is, uh, ministers my voice to your ears. And, of course, we have some internet in between. You get the idea, though. Um, so um, we see that uh, the angels are, are active in both bringing forth graces and also bringing up our prayers to God, our worship, and bringing God's graces to us. They are kind of a, when we hear the word ministering angels, you might almost think of the word conduit. Um, so involved are the angels in, in the ministration of creation that, uh, for example, Thomas Aquinas 
you know, if you were to see a leaf falling from the tree and onto the ground, how does, it, how does that happen? Well, we, we say gravity because we're materialists. But Thomas would say, well, an angel brings it down. And in a certain sense, both are right. The Lord makes use of natural causes, but still he ministers everything through, through his angels. Or, for example, to put it in modern terms, if we were to say, well, how does an airplane lift up? Well, we think, ah, ah it's thrust and, and, and it's lift, you know, so the, the pressure beneath the wing is a little higher than the pressure above the wing, and a little bit of thrust, and the plane lifts off, and because we're materialists, that's how we speak today, uh, but, but, um, uh, but Thomas would say, well, no, the angels lift, lift the plane up. Now, again, Thomas is not being stupid uh, or in, uh, unmodern, uh, but, but in a certain sense, you see, both are right, all right? Uh, this mysterious force we call gravity, we don't know really what it is. We can measure it, but we don't really know. Are there invisible cords that pull the leaf down or lift the, you know, lift the plane up? Uh, you know, we don't know. Um, so again, this mysterious, this force we call gravity that we either resist or that we obey. And uh, so all that's just a way of saying that the angels are intimately involved in every aspect of creation, not just in the creation, but in the, in the, um, you know, maintenance and the, 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 the sustaining of all of creation. God works through his angels. All right. Now then, um, we want to turn attention as we look to the sacraments first to baptism. Now, in terms of baptism, we're, I want to break it into two parts because um, we see that um, there's a kind of a preparation for baptism that needs to take place. And then there's the baptism itself. So in terms of the preparation, most of the fathers see that, that, that in terms of God's work, there's a visible element and an invisible element. Now, the visible element of bringing people to baptism is the apostles and their commission. So the apostles were sent visibly to all the nations, the great commission, right? Go ye therefore into all the nations and, and, and teach them everything that I have commanded you and baptize them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So we see that the apostles and by extension their successors and all of us, go forth. That's the visible element. Go forth to all the nations. We announce the gospel of Christ. We draw people to holy baptism. Uh, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of your sins. So that's the visible element. But gee, even as the apostles uh, and their successors are sent, so too are the angels sent invisibly to prepare many for the gospel, the many for the gospel, and to gather the faithful into the universal church. Um, now, uh, another image comes to mind here. You may remember when the Lord had, he, get, he gathered 72 disciples and he sent them out two by two to the, all the towns and the villages that he, that he um, intended to visit. So, you know, uh, let, let's, let's avoid this kind of uh, idea of Jesus as kind of a wandering hippie. Well, I don't know, man, where should we go? I don't know, man, let's go over that hill. You know, it wasn't that big. Christ actually had a plan. And he knew the towns and the villages that he would visit, and he sent an entourage on ahead of him. Two of the, two of the 72 disciples would go to this town, two to that town, and so forth, to prepare. So that when Christ entered, the people were prepared to accept the, the, great, the great one is coming, the great miracle worker, the great rabbi, he who many think is the Messiah, he is coming. Uh, and people were prepared. Well, in a certain sense, God not only sends out the apostles, but even on ahead of them, the, the angels, the angels, to bring people to a readiness to hear the gospel. And this is part of the work of the angels. And um, now, um, scripturally, let's, 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 there's a picture of this. In the Mount Olivet Discourse, I'm going to read Mark's version here. The Lord talks about um, when, the, when the temple was destroyed and so on. He, the, this is, you know, the Mount Olivet Discourse is describing the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. And when, uh, when the Messiah comes in his glory, that is to say, um, he, he, he now, uh, you know, is, is seen uh, for the Lord and Messiah that he is. It says here, and the Lord will send out his angels to gather his elect from the four winds, from all the ends of the earth, unto the ends, uh, from all the four corners of the earth. So we see there's a picture here of the angels going out in this quote, with the age of the church. With the destruction of the temple comes the age of the church. And one of the images in the scriptures is God is not just sending out his apostles, but he's sending out his angels to gather in his elect. 
uh, and into the kingdom. So this is a work not just of the apostles and of us, or evangelizers, but it is the work of the angels as well, who cooperate and in a way prepare the ground for uh, the planting of the gospel seed, the word, okay? So um, uh, that's, by the way, Mark 13, 27. It'll be in your notes. But see that picture, the angels going to the four ends of the earth. So we are living in the final age. It's called the age of the church. And it's an age where we gather in. And when the number of the elect is complete, the book is closed, and Christ will come to judge the living and the dead. All right? So there's an old spiritual. I love it. It's a, it has this picture. It says, uh, Oh, preacher, fold your Bible. For the last souls converted, fare you well, fare you well, in that great getting up morning. Fare you well, fare you well. But right now, in the age of the church, this final age in which we are living, both we and the angels are gathering in God's elect from the four corners of the earth. All right. We also see um, that it would seem that every, just as every Region, we call them dioceses in the Latin church. I think it's eparchies in the, uh, in, the right, in the Eastern rites. But the whole world is divided into parishes and into dioceses. And it would seem that just as every mm, diocese has a bishop, uh, so does every diocese or local church have an angel. And so we see that in the book of Revelation, chapter 2 and 3. To the, to the angel of the church of Ephesus, write this. To the angel of the church of Smyrna, write this, and so on. Now, some just interpret angel just means bishop there. But what the fathers of the church see is that the visible element is, is the bishop. But there's an invisible element, an angel, that's over each church and, and works along with the bishop. Um, and so there's a, there's, a, there's a very interesting quote here that regarding the angels of the church's origin goes so far as to say that there are two bishops in each local church, one visible, the other invisible, and they are busied with the same task. <laughs> so again, we see this magnificent thought of the fathers of the church and, and in the scriptures that there is always this invisible element going on, um, hid from our eyes because of our sinful blindness. Uh, our, blind, our sin has blinded us, and so we don't see the work of the angels like we, we, like we could. But now you see, with faith, our eyes are open, and we see that there isn't just a bishop, but there's an angel. And perhaps I, I could go so far as to say, I suspect that I'm the pastor at this parish, but there's an angel also overseeing this parish of mine. Um, perhaps each family has an angel, even as well as, fa as a father and a mother. Now, again... I, I'm not saying I got all the evidence in the world for this. I'll give you 50 scripture quotes. I'm just kind of thinking through that angels aren't just, we don't just have guardian angels, each as individuals, but the nations have angels, that uh, the churches, dioceses have, parishes have angels, that we start to see that there are angels at, at each level of, of, of our organization in the church. All right. Now then, um, so here we have this image of the apostles being sent to gather in all the elect. But likewise, angels we see in Scripture from Mark 13, uh, that angels are also gathering in the elect. We see, we see all of these things. Now, regarding this gathering in, we still haven't gotten to the baptism itself. Eusebius remarks that it is the mission of the angels to draw souls to baptism. It's, it is also, he says, a battle against idolatry, against demons who hold souls captive. So part of the battle, of course, in, in bringing someone to baptism, particularly an adult, is that they have been held captive uh, by, the, by the kingdom of darkness in some sense. Um, doesn't mean they were living a horrifying life or whatever, but to some degree they were in ignorance and in darkness. And I'm going to tell you right now, just as we, we got angels assigned to it, I don't have any doubt there's certain demons assigned. And, you know, you know the old screw tape letters, we have these traditions. And I'm just going to tell you right now that the angel, your guardian angel, and perhaps, you know, these angels that are sent out to prepare holy souls for baptism, uh, there's a battle that they engage in an invisible level where they, in effect, say, this soul is being claimed for Christ. Um, and they say to the demons, consider yourself dismissed. But I doubt they go quickly or, or simply. And that's why, for example, in the rite of baptism, especially for adults, we go through a series of exorcisms. Um, and we spend time teaching and bringing them to the light. And, uh, you know, in the ancient church, it was a three-year process. Uh, and there were not numerous exorcisms and things performed. Um, 
in the newer rites of RCIA, these exorcisms are so vague that I, I wonder if even the, de the demons know they're being exorcised. I mean, like, you know, it's, it's kind of vague, but it's still called an exorcism for what it's worth. Um, I sneak some of the old exorcisms back and I'm going to tell you all, I mean, you know, up until 1970, we had some pretty powerful exorcisms and they were not messing around and there was no ambiguity. So that you would bring people, even in the, say, in the 1950s and 60s, you know, the old ritual, it was very clear that, you know, a number of exorcisms were to be read over them. And by gosh, they were, they were strong. So there's a battle that the angels engage in on behalf of those souls who are being called to baptism, where they again duke it out and they move back the power of the demons and they claim this soul for Christ, even as the evangelization process is somehow reaching them. All right. So that's Eusebius. The sacramentary of Gelasius, which is a very ancient sacramentary in the church, has a prayer for catechumens and begs that the Lord would vouchsafe to send his holy angel to persevere, or, or, sorry, to preserve his servants and to lead them uh, to the grace of baptism. Okay? Um, so again, um, the work of the angels, you see, is appreciated here and mentioned in this prayer that it isn't just some persuasive catechist or a sponsor or a family member or some a generant preacher that's working to bring the soul. It's also the angels who are going ahead and helping. Now here is um, a prayer of, um, of origin who writes this come angel, receive him who has been converted from his former error and from doctrines of demons, receive him, uh, receive him as a careful physician, warm and heal him. Receive him and give him the baptism of second birth. So here in this prayer, Origen asked that the, the, the angel would do the work of a physician, bringing a person out of darkness and error, the work of a teacher. Likewise, that the angel would lead them, if you will, right into the waters of baptism. So all along, the angel, the angel uh, working, or the angels with, uh, with and along with, with the visible elements of the church. Okay. So that's just getting us ready for baptism. Now let's go to the, to the role of angels in baptism itself. And um, it says, um, you, you may remember, by the way, um, in John chapter 5, there was a, a, an invalid, a paralyzed man who was lying by the side of the sheep pools there at, at Bethesda and just outside the temple gates. And you may remember that what would happen was every now and again, the angel of God would stir the waters and the first one in would receive healing. So we see this idea, uh, it's kind of pointing forward to, again, that in, in, in a hidden way, angels are working even in the waters of baptism uh, and drawing people and working in the moment of baptism to, uh, to bring about um, healing. So with that in mind, Tertullian speaks of the role of the angels in baptism. He says this, cleanse in the water by the action of an angel. We are prepared for the Holy Spirit. Thus, an angel is set in charge of baptism, says Tertullian. Now, again, there's a visible element, the priest. And I don't doubt for a minute that he's the minister of that sacrament. But there's also a hidden minister, someone else involved in that baptism that God works with. And that is the angel in charge of baptism. You say, but Father, would that maybe be their guardian angel? Maybe. But it might be um, <coughs> that certain angels are set in charge over baptisms to um, to bring forth, uh, you know, the effects and so on in baptism. All right. Now, Origen says at the time of uh, at the time that the sacrament of faith, namely baptism, was administered to you, there were present heavenly powers, the ministration of angels. So again, he acknowledges their role in the liturgy of baptism. Or again, Ambrose says after baptism, you began to advance. The angels watched, and they saw you draw near. They they saw you draw near to the waters of baptism, and coming forth. Suddenly, they beheld the splendor of your state. And they asked, who is this coming up from the desert, shining white? The beautiful quote from the Song of Songs, you know. Who is this coming up from the desert, shining white? So the angels marvel at the transformation as you come forth from the baptismal font. Goes on to say, thus the angels are lost in admiration. Do you want to know how great their admiration is? Listen to the apostle Peter as he tells you that we have all been given what angels long to look upon. Uh, so again, there is this, um, um, you know, there is this beautiful, um, you know, image here um, of the angels. Once again, as they marveled, as Christ entered into the heavens in his human form, as well as his divine, 
uh, uh, nature. And, and, and they marvel at that. But they marvel at you as you come forth from the baptismal font. And again, they, 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 you know, they, they, you know, as I say, uh, um, Ambrose has them saying, who is this coming up from the desert shining white? Quoting from the Song of Songs. Or again, Peter, that the angels long to look into these things and fill with admiration at the transformation as you come forth from the baptismal water. So again, we hardly think of these things, do we? Right? You know, we hardly think. And yet, these things were pondered by the, by the fathers um, in, 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 in every sense. Now, with that in mind, I want to stop, um, Angela, and maybe there's some questions um, about what we talked about with baptism, we're going to then move into the liturgy in general, and particularly the liturgy of the Eucharist. But are there any questions, or do the panelists have questions? <coughs> uh, there are no questions in the Q&A box that uh, specifically deal with what you were just um, discussing, but I'll open the floor for any panelists who might have a question. Yeah. Let me ask you to think about something. Um, in, a little, in, a, in a certain sense, um, some of this may strike us as fanciful. I mean, what evidence do they give? They, they just, they're dreaming and they have these ideas. But I would ask you, uh, well, first of all, does that ring true with you? Or, or how do you see these reflections of the fathers? And how would you answer someone that says, well, these are just fanciful things? <laughs> today, today in the Office of Readings, it was beautiful. Um, commentary on Jesus and what he's done for us. Yes, yes. Um, he bore our infirmities and endured our sorrows. He was wounded for our sake so that by his wounds we might be healed. Yes. He redeemed us from the curse by becoming a curse, etc. Mm -hmm. And amazingly, I, I thought of the angels. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which, which I, I really love because now when I'm reading things, I just think of how wonderful God is. Yes. And I think of those angels, you know, mm -hmm. being so excited that Jesus is coming and who's coming, you know, mm -hmm. and they're going up. And that, that's a really, it's, it, it, it really affects a lot of my readings. Which yeah. I'm surprised at. So I, I liked, they give me a sense of, um, of beauty and of a way of really understanding it. Because when you read these words all the time, they don't really have an effect on you. You know what right. um, I mean? Maybe I'll answer my own question for a minute, though. Are some of these... Um, musings of the church fathers, just sort of fanciful things and so on. Well, I would, I would try to remind you a little bit about the, who the church fathers are. They're not just anybody. They're not just Charles Pope sitting in Washington, D.C. saying, oh, like, I see a vision, man, and, you know. But they're the fathers of the church. Now, there's a couple of reasons why that's important. First of all, especially the most ancient fathers are very in touch with the apostolic traditions and things that were passed back and forth. They, they're echoing and also influencing, but echoing, the faith of the early Christian community. So it's a doorway into this. And I, I want to say, particularly for us moderns who, who are very materialistic, and I don't just mean that we are greedy and acquire a lot of stuff, but we always want to explain everything in physics and matter and you know, the spirit, who cares about that? And, and so I'm not saying all of you are like that, but I'm saying we live in times where any idea of the mystical hidden world of angels and demons and these things that are going on all around us, yet hid from our eyes, is simply dismissed as either irrelevant or non-existent because you can't put it seen in a microscope or in a telescope or you can't weigh it on a scale. And so we need kind of a remedy, you know, to, to, for this. So the church fathers are not just anybody. They were very influential. They were great theologians. They were, they were, they had, most of them had very re great reputations for holiness and certainly for learnedness and study. And they speak with the collective kind of conscience of the ancient and early church. So again, we do well to, I think, heed um, the fact that these are not just any group of men. Um, they, are, they are well attested. Uh, they are very formative and reflective of the earliest days of the church, where some of them were actually, you know, just a generation or two away from the original apostles. So all of these are ways of saying that we, we don't, this, these things are not dogma that I've been reading to you. Uh, the church has not dogmatized this, but rather, I would call it um, reputable tradition, um, giving us a glimpse to the belief and the uh, understandings of the early Christians. So we have a very reputable and safe tradition here that we can, that we can build on, and I think take uh, with great, a great degree of certitude, even if it isn't 
official doctrine or dogma, all these points that have been read. Okay. And that's kind of how I would answer my own question. Okay. Any other last minute wrap ups or questions and we'll go on. Okay. Uh, is it Deacon Joshua there? Is that, yeah. Okay. Yes. So, um, I guess my question would be, is it kind of like we muddy it ourselves with the, the modern, with the materialistic point of view, then we just kind of muddy that vision to where it's much more simpler to understand that the angels are actually there working with, um, maybe what we see as materialism. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but because we have that materialistic point of view, we, we actually muddy everything up um, and, and, and take away the simplicity of it. Yeah. And also, I think uh, what we, what we want to say is that the church fathers did more than just have a vague idea that angels were involved. They did root their, their thinking in scriptures and in specific attributes and they, they connect these things in a way. And we're, we're we, so you, you use the word money. I might use the word vague We're we're, even if we're on board with this, it's all kind of vague and shadowy to us. But the, the fathers of the church, because they were much more spiritual and lived in a more spiritual time, speak with greater precision to what they see happening here. Both And they rooted in scripture as well as in the sacred tradition and experience of the early church. So it's a good medicine for us that even if we try to be spiritual, we don't want to just be vague or murky or muddy it up and it's all kind of somehow vaguely there, but we don't really have much to say other than that. You know, and this is, this helps to give us a vocabulary and a way of thinking. If that, I don't know if that's exactly what you're getting at, but that's what I hear you say. Yeah. Yep. Okay, good. All right, well, let's move on to, and uh, <clears throat> we'll look now to the liturgy specifically though, to the liturgy, we'll move quickly to the liturgy of the, of the, of the Eucharist. But with that in mind, uh, I want to just, first of all, look at the role of the angels in every liturgy, you know, in a general sense. Remember, there's a liturgy of the Mass, but there's also liturgy of baptism. There's a liturgy of, of, of penance, and there's a, you know, a liturgy of, of, of marriage, and so on. So, all right. Now, origin reasons that if the angel of the Lord shall encamp around them that fear him and shall deliver them, uh, that, um, and by the way, that's from Psalm 47, right? Um, if the angel of the Lord shall encamp around those that fear him uh, and deliver them, then it is probable that they are that that when many um, uh, many are assembled legitimately for the glory of Christ, that the angel of uh, the angel of God encamps around each of them that fear God. Um, thus, when the uh, saints are gathered, there is a twofold church that of men and angels. So you're starting to see a kind of a consistent pattern here, right? When the church gathers. The Bible says in the book of Psalms that the angel of the Lord encamps around those that fear him and in order to deliver them. So if that be the case, then when God's people are faithfully gathered in in the liturgy, surely then the angels of God gather with us. So again, using scripture, uh, origin reasons that the angels are very um, present to every liturgical action, whenever the people of God gather. You remember how the Lord said, whenever two or three gather together in my name, there am I in the midst of them, right? And yet where Christ is, his angels are with him because his angels minister to him. So we can reason from that scripture as well. <coughs> it certainly follows, and I, I don't think this is like, well, this is shocking, Father. I've never heard this before. But I mean, you see what's happening here, getting back to uh, Deacon Joshua's uh, point, which is that uh, there is a... Um, um, we go from the, just the murky sense to now we see a scripture or two that remind us and say, ah, there's a basis for this thinking, not just, well, I think it's like, it sounds like cool, man. It's like, sounds right. Um, yeah, I bet a lot of angels are around, you know? So it's more, we, we, we only get clearer than that. And the fathers of the church help us to do that. Now, regarding the homily, <laughs> I love this one. Origin warns that the angels of God are listening to it and they are judging it. <laughs> Okie dokie. All right. Um, likewise, origin reasons. Though our eyes are dimmed due to sin, we cannot see the and we cannot see the multitude of angels. Nevertheless, Scripture attests to their presence. For example, we read here. There's a wonderful passage from Second Kings, um, where uh, Elisha uh, is um, uh, being pursued by an army, and his assistant, his young assistant, is very discouraged. So I'm going to pick up the story here from 2 Kings. When the young servant of Elisha, the man of God, got up and went out early in the morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. So he asked Elisha, oh, my master, what are we to do? Elisha answered him, do not be afraid. 
For those who are with us are more than those who are against us. I'm sorry, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And then Elisha prayed, O Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. And uh, the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw that the hills were filled with horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Wow, you know, what a vision, huh? You know, it's, it's, that, it's just a magnificent sense. So here he is, he's discouraged, the, the armies of, of the Arameans and all, all those are, are around, they're surrounding the city, and it looks pretty grim. And Elisha says, don't worry, we've got an army too. Well, and then he says, Lord, he can't see the army. Let him see. And all of a sudden, he sees again all the hillsides full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. So again, um, would that we could see. And remember, now there's two things to learn from this. Not only that there is an army of angels about us, but also that they are more numerous, more numerous than the, um, than the demons or any other human army or any other weapon waged against us, you see, that, uh, that the angels who are with us far outnumber those who are against us, the fallen angels, and any, any other minions or, or assistance of Satan, be it human or, or, uh, or, or demonic. Um, but also that this would also make sense then that at the, at the liturgy, that the angels far outnumber us who are gathered. Okay, we'll see that in a minute. Okay, again, Psalm 68 says this, the chariots of God are 10,000 and thousands of thousands. Uh, the Lord has come from Sinai into his sanctuary. So again, we see the armies of the angels that are invisible to our eyes, but are nevertheless yet said to be present among us. So when we gather for the liturgy, the multitudes of angels, myriad upon myriad of angels serving Christ and, and, and facilitating the liturgy and assisting us and surrounding us with, with, with protection. For indeed, the angel of the Lord shall encamp around those who uh, fear the Lord, and he shall deliver them. See, all right? Now, um, the, um, so we, 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 we just look to any gathering, any liturgical gathering of God's faithful and generic sense here. Now let's move into the liturgy of the Eucharist itself. The Mass, we are reminded, um, and I've, I've talked to you about this before, maybe in one of the series on the angels, or maybe back in the Catechism series, but I, I think that it's important for us to remember that the Mass is actually a participation in the heavenly liturgy, right? Thus, there are myriads of angels and many saints round about in every Eucharistic liturgy. In my church, we have a beautiful example of this um, on the Clare story, which is the upper walls of the church, you know, way up high near the roof line are painted over 35 saints surrounding us, you know, uh, and they are gathered with us. And of course, many, many more saints besides, and then myriads of angels in, in festival gathering surround us. And the idea is that um, uh, in, in, in the liturgy, it's not so much that heaven comes down to earth, but rather that we are caught up into heaven. And that we'll see that more in a moment. But listen to this reading from Hebrews, describing the liturgy. He, he, he begins this section of Hebrews in the 12th chapter by reminding, you know, you remember how in the, in, in, in the days at Mount Sinai, uh, there, were, there was fear and smoke and fire and people were terrified and they, even, they couldn't even touch the base of the mountain. They said, Moses, you go up there and talk to him. We can't even stand to hear his voice. So they were terrified at the foot of that mountain. But he says, now, because of Christ, he says, you, and this is a, he's speaking here now of the liturgy particularly, you have come to Mount Zion to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to myriads of angels in joyful assembly to the congregation of the firstborn enrolled in heaven. You have come to the God who is the judge of all men and to the spirits of the righteous people made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word more eloquently than that of the blood of Abraham. So we see that in every liturgy, it says here, there is myriads of angels. Likewise, uh, to, um, you come to Christ himself. Um, you have also come uh, into the presence of the spirits of righteous men and women made perfect. All right, the saints, in other words, and of course, right to Jesus. So you see, um, the liturgy is a busy place. Uh, we're not talking about cast of thousands here. We're talking cast of myriads, undetermined numbers of uh, of, of angels and also of saints and uh, and so on. Okay, Saint John Chrysostom says that the angels surround the priest 
at the liturgy, and the whole sanctuary is filled with angels honoring Christ present in the Eucharist. And he adds that although we are lowly, we have been deemed worthy to join the powers of heaven in the worship of the Lord. Imagine being admitted to the company of angels who worship him so beautifully. We, though lowly, have been deemed worthy to join them. All right, uh, so... Uh, with, with angels and archangels, with thrones and dominions, and with all the hosts. This is from the preface. At the end of the preface, the uh, the priest says, as you know, in the Roman rite anyway, that the the uh, I think also most of the Eastern rites, you have the preface is concluded with a, a statement like this that reminds us that we're not just the folks gathered at our local little parish, just all, us, us just little folks here, but rather this that we are we, we are going to sing with the angels and the archangels with thrones and dominions, with all the hosts and the powers of heaven. And we sing the hymn of your glory as without end we acclaim, holy, 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 Lord God of hosts. Now, St. John Chrysostom reflects on the preface. He says, reflect upon who it is you are near and with whom you are about to invoke God. You are with the cherubim. Think, uh, think of the choirs of, uh, of, of angels that you're about to enter. Let no one have any thought of earth and, you know, source some quarter, lift up your hearts, right? Let, let him lose himself of every earthly thing and transport himself whole and entire into heaven and let him abide there beside every throne of glory, hovering up with the seraphim and singing the most holy song of God to the God of glory and majesty. Chrysostom also further notes that the Gloria is the song of the lower angels, even the catechumens can sing it. But the Sanctus, the Holy Holy, is the song of the seraphim, the highest angels in heaven, that, that sing in the very sanctuary of the Trinity. It is reserved for the baptized. So we have these uh, magnificent images. You know, and I've, I've said this to you before, one of the most missed moments in the Mass. Oh, my gosh. Talk about a, a dud. The priest says, the Lord, the Lord be with you. Go ahead and answer. All right, the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We've lifted them up to the Lord. Are you praying with me? What is the priest saying? Brethren, by God's grace, we are in heaven now. And not just in, we are now brought into the holy of holies, to the highest place of heaven, where the cherubim and the seraphim and the thrones minister to the very Trinity. And we join with them in singing the highest song of the highest angels. And how can we do that? Only in Christ, in Christ Jesus. As a member of his body, we are caught up into the highest heavens to sing the song of the highest angels. Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts. All right. So we have then, um, and of course, the, there's also that beautiful um, tradition in the Eastern church where they cry out in the Greek, you know, agiototeos, agios iskeros, agios atanatos. Holy God, holy mighty one, holy immortal one, have mercy upon us. You see? So again, um, the, the sort of a the kind of the transport, if you will, <coughs> of the liturgy where it's not so much that heaven comes down to us, but that we go up to heaven and join with myriads of angels in festival gathering. Um, so we have a, a magnificent, um, a magnificent image here. Theodore of Mapuesia sees the deacons who arrange the sacrifice on the altar. Um, he says, in them, we can see an image of the invisible power of the angels also ministering at the Eucharist. So again, you have here a, uh, the visible, the deacons ministering at the altar. You also see an image, though, of the invisible, where, with, which is the angels also ministering at the altar. <coughs> so um, I hope that your heart's soaring a little bit. Are, how you doing out there? You know, anyone having some church up there with me all right all right <laughs> now i want to say that um that just maybe as an afterward saint john chrysostom says for uh, if the very air is filled with angels how much more the church here the apostles uh here the apostles teaching this when he bids women to cover their heads with a veil because of the presence of the angels indeed the angels exult the archangels rejoice the cherubim and the seraphim join us in the celebration of the feast. And, and, and what room is there for sadness? Okay. Now, by the way, uh, we talked a little bit about this last week. I think a question came in last week about 
women veiling their head on account of the angels. So I mentioned to you that my own thought on that text is that that's probably a reference to the priest. Um, however, you see here that John Chrysostom would not agree with me. He thinks that it just, he just takes it at face value that the angels are present and therefore women should veil their heads. Now he doesn't say why. And so again, I, I think one could say, well, um, it's a sign of reverence in the presence of the angels. So a woman's hair is her glory. I know much how, how much time you women, many of you women spend on your hair, uh, how important it is to you. Um, you know, I just cut my own hair and go like this with a, you know, clippers and um, I'm done. Um, but I know that, um, that's almost, you know, now I, I'm, I'm playing around a little bit. I know that some women, uh, some cultures, you know, value hair even more than others, but you get it as a general norm. A woman's hair is her glory. And so therefore a woman ought to veil uh, her glory when she comes before, when she comes before the, um, uh, the angels, but also of course, before God. Uh, so that makes some sense that maybe a Christendom is getting at that. I do not think that we should think that a woman should veil her hair because the her beauty might distract the angels. They 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 don't they they don't have bodies. Uh, they they are not struggling with lust. Um, so I I don't think that's the explanation. All right. Uh, if the angels are the priests, then that makes more sense. That maybe a woman should cover the the, the beauty of her hair um, um, and to some degree cover her beauty so that the priests won't be too distracted by it. But he, there are different traditions about that text. But I do think this that. Let's also look at the example of a man. What is a man generally expected to do uh, with his head when he enters the church? You know, up until recently, most cultures, men wore hats. And I probably should wear a hat more because I get sunburn up here. You know, not this time of year, but, you know. Uh, and, of course, in the colder, you know, I need to cover it. But anyway, in most cultures, um, uh, up until very recently, even in our own culture, men wore hats. And men tend to also do things with their hats to indicate rank or something about them. Like these days, everyone's into sports. So you, you got to wear some sports thing up there. You know, you get the idea. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of messaging going on with hats, you know, and um, um, all right, there we go. We got a hat coming out there, <laughs> but anyway, uh, <laughs> nice fedora. looks like, yeah. All right, cool. I got a fedora. I've also got my Beretta, but it's not here. But anyway, like for example, in the in the priesthood, we we uh, my Monsignor's Beretta has a purple palm. Aren't you impressed? You know, uh, a, a lower ranking clergy have a black palm, uh, and so on. Cardinals wear colors. You know, all these things go on. There's ranks and insignias. But when it comes to the moment where we go to the altar, we shed all that. Even the zacchettos, all that stuff is taken, and the priest goes bareheaded before the Lord, because men. Their, you know, their hat in a way is their glory in the sense that um, we tend to indicate rank and other things. This is common in the military as well. Ranks and insignias are done on hats as well as shoulders and things like that. So you get the point. What are we? What's what's what we're really doing here is we're acknowledging that we we are lowly and humble before God, that the glorious angels are are with us, and that we, though lowly and humble by Christ, have been lifted up and exalted, and we have every right now to stand before God in that holy place with holy hands lifted up and praise him to join the highest angel and to join that hymn. And this is a great and a glorious thing, but we must always remember to maintain some degree of humility. All right. So I think that whatever tradition you might have about women covering or veiling because of the, um, because of the angels, whether it's the clergy, one tradition, or it really is the angels, either way, modesty, humility, and um, covering our glory, setting aside our glory, you know, uh, are, are appropriate when it comes to the liturgy. You may remember in the um, uh, book of Revelation that there are 24 elders seated around the throne, and it says they cast their crowns down before the Lord of glory. They just cast it, their crowns down onto the glassy sea. Um, and uh, again, indicating that before God, any human rank is of no avail. We're all simple, humble beggars before God. Nevertheless, he has exalted us. Okay, now, uh, there was one other thing I was going to try to say here, but it, it slipped away from me. So let me let me see if there's some questions um, on the panel, and then maybe from our Q and A box. Or do any of the panelists have questions? 
I just want to jump in and say, Monsignor, it was very inspiring what you were sharing about the liturgy. It's so beautiful to yeah. think about our, uh, our being taken up into the into the throne of God and, and to worship there with the angels. It's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's just an amazing thing when you think what the liturgy really is. And yeah. we're, we're, you know, we're worried about whether our favorite song got sung or why somebody sitting in my pew or, you know, gosh knows what we're thinking about, you know. And I will say, though, that, you know, we've gotten awfully homespun with the liturgy in the Western Rite anyway, you know, the Roman Rite. Um, it's kind of dorky at times, you know. And we all, we've almost intentionally dumbed it down. And I'm not trying to say the only way to do Mass is Latin Solemn High. Uh, I'm just saying that there ought to be some sense that we're going before God. And we don't always have to do it the same way. For example, the reverence in my congregation um, at, our, at our gospel liturgy, which is primarily you know, an African-American expression, but it's very rich in its adoration and love of God. Uh, all the music is about God and how good God is and how glorious and that we ought to be grateful and so on. So I'm not trying to absolutely specify that there's only one way to be reverent, but my gosh, there's just sort of this, we don't, we hardly ever dress up. We walk in, we're annoyed if it goes more than 45 minutes, we're sort of goofing off and talking and we're doing almost anything, but just being mesmerized and caught up into the glory that these fathers of the church are describing about the liturgy. I know our minds are very weak, but oh my goodness. We have got to discipline ourselves more, and priests especially. We've got to be better about showing up and being reverent, um, not just being, you no know, Johnny, whatever, you know, uh, the entertainer. Hey, I'm with you. You know, I have the center of your attention. They need to wish you a good morning, and how y'all doing? It's kind of cold today, isn't it? <laughs> well, let's get around to saying a prayer, you know? I mean, it's very hokey at times, and there's no sense that, we're really here uh, to adore God and be caught up into a liturgy in the very highest heaven. So anyway, I'm we, preaching, but it's a, it's a, this, the, the, uh, the, you know, the chanting of the liturgy, Monsignor, whether that's in the Roman rite or in the Byzantine or whatever, just, yeah. just singing the liturgy helps to elevate us to that. You know, as, as the fathers tell us, this common speech of men is not, is not uh, adequate for the glory of God. So we, you come before the Lord, you sing. And it's, it's beautiful. Amen. Yeah. And singing can be humbling. <laughs> All right. Yes, Angela. You have a... Did you have a question, Paul? Oh. I, I scooted over to see if he was going to answer it later, but um, you talked about how there's the angelic songs in the liturgy, the one of the lower angels, and then right before the consecration, the higher angels. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you talked about the deacons. Um, do you see different uh the different choirs of angels reflected in the different ministers of the mass deacons subdeacons for those who've mm -hmm. heard of that acolytes and lectors and such well you know it's interesting there seems to be a rule of thumb among the fathers of the church that the visible element namely a deacon a priest a lecturer someone uh is somehow coupled with an invisible you know in this case you know an angel so i think that i would say yes uh that the ministerial roles probably would so that any angels would assist in the proclamation of the word of God by the lector, uh, the deacon, and, and, and so on. And likewise, um, the priest. And there's a tradition among uh, many uh, that priests not only have a guardian angel, but an empowering angel. So it's, 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 these are traditions. They're not dogmas. But again, I think it makes sense, doesn't it, that a priest who has a special ministerial role would be maybe more than just a guardian angel would, would be, it would be fit that he has at least one empowering angel. Uh, we've seen how they're empowering angels for baptism and we looked at that sacrament in particular. So I think it's, it's, it's a strong likelihood. So I don't know if you have a thought on that father, Hezekiah. No, I was just going to add, there's a beautiful commentary by, I'm just the, the, I was looking him up just now, the, uh, one of the church fathers on the divine liturgy where he talks about every aspect of the liturgy in symbolic terms and and its and fulfillment we're going to send a link to that in your email tomorrow so take a look for that if you're interested in kind of getting in a little deeper on the divine liturgy itself this is a f fantastic uh commentary yeah great uh i have a non-angel question uh send that to you separate or go with it <laughs> Well, Angela, is there, are there other questions about tonight's topic? We have topic? a lot of other questions um, and dealing with angels, so I think we'll have to hold that one, Paul. Okay. Um, one of the questions that we had 
um, was someone actually asking, I'm not sure if you're going to uh, cover this later, but in speaking of the Sacrament of Reconciliation, considering we've talked about liturgy mm -hmm. and some mm -hmm. of the other parts here, is there a role that the angels in, the sa in that sacrament, and is that specifically the guardian angel? Oh, interesting. Um, I, I would think certainly one's guardian angel would have a big role in bringing one to repentance, uh, not just repentance, but even just reminding all of us. I, I, I've often thought that it, it, there's one description of conscience that it's the voice of God echoing in our very depths. But I, I wonder if God doesn't facilitate that through our guardian angel. And remember, a guardian angel doesn't just mean someone who guards you from danger, but who warns you and teaches you and says, no, you have no business doing that. Um, and God tells us to heed the, our angel because his voice is my voice. So I think that there would be a lot of role that the guardian angel would play in bringing somebody to the, um, um, you know, to the sacrament to begin with, and maybe assisting them in their examination of conscience. Regarding the priest, I think here too, I, I just mentioned that I think priests have an empowering angel. I think certainly um, that the angels also facilitate the graces that come, just as they facilitate everything. Uh, but again, I, I, I don't um, have an immediate scripture that comes to mind or uh, quote, the, and th that was not covered in the book here. Um, we didn't cover all the sacraments in the book. You know, it's not a real thick book, but it's meant to help us see sort of by way of example, baptism and then the Eucharist. But it, I think the, the answer to the question is yes, yes to those things. Uh, Monsignor, we have a question coming in from uh, Father John, who's participating with us in this in this study, um, and he's asking the question. I think somewhat based or related to Philippians chapter two, um, we're talking about the exaltation of Christ in our in our human nature. He asks a very important question. He says, "Because of the incarnation, will we have more power and knowledge than the angels after the final judgment, the coming of the new heavens and new earth?" when our new glorified body will be joined with our glorified soul? It's an interesting question. Yeah, um, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I, I could go either way with that. I think, you know, the intellect of angels is, is purely spiritual, may, may have more of expansive qualities. They learn very differently. They have infused knowledge. Um, so I, um, I don't know. On the other hand, as he's already hinting at in the answer, I mean, his question, because on account of the incarnation that we have an intimacy with Christ and, you know, his human nature isn't just his human nature, like an appendage. I mean, he joins his human and divine nature in one person. And um, so I think that um, on account of that, we will we'll have insights that the angels can't have. On the other hand, maybe they, because they're pure spirit, they would have insights and experiences of Christ um, uh, in terms of his spiritual, you know, divine, because, you know, Although angels aren't divine, they have they are pure spirits as as is the divine nature. They may have uh, insights that we won't have. But I I think on account of how Christ has so closely united us to Himself in the incarnation and exalted us far above the angels again, as as the thing says, that it's, it's arguable that we will we will have maybe not in a broad sense, but in spe it's, it's cer certainly in certain aspects we'll have deeper knowledge than the angels. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, speculative theology alert. <laughs> okay. Um, there are a couple of people that were wondering um, how there are practical ways um, that we can be more aware of the angels in, in our liturgy. Um, one person was asking, um, you know, if we are, if there's a particular prayer to the angels associated with each person's role in the mass, um, mm -hmm. just how we can be more cognizant of their presence. Yeah. You know, in, in the old days, uh, it was almost de rigueur that a Catholic altar would have two angels, at least, uh, on either end of it. Kind of a, pointing back also to the, uh, to the Ark of the Covenant, huh? Uh, I know that uh, in the Eastern churches, there's a lot of icons and so on, the angels, um, uh, the cherubim, all of these things uh, are there. So I think at, at one level, we could do a better job in our churches of um, helping people. Because, you know, we're, our minds are very weak. And we need, we need reminders. So whether through art or angels and so on, um, as far as prayers, I, I mean, nothing immediately comes to mind. I, I, mean, I, I have vague remembrance that uh, Thomas Aquinas in the, in the collection of prayers at the back of the sacramentary has a kind of a, uh, has a kind of a, uh, um, you know, um, 
a prayer that includes awareness of the angels. But um, and I don't know, Father, you have, or anyone else have other ideas? I mean, this is something we could all, we're all human beings here. So how, how do we, how do we help do that? You know, if, if somebody wants to add. I was going to add, Monsignor, that you're right about those beautiful angels traditionally placed on either side of the altar, um, which which I've always understood in terms of the angels guarding the way to the tree of life. And here we're approaching this restoration of the Garden of Eden, and the angels now have lifted their sword. There's a beautiful commentary of St. Ephraim where he says, at the moment of the crucifixion, um, uh, the angels uh, with a flaming sword guarding the way of the tree of life saw man trying to enter back into paradise mm. and thrust the sword into his side. Mm. Huh? And, and Jesus broke the sword, breaking the barrier, obviously using highly symbolic language here, but nevertheless saying that we stand in the place of the angels and Jesus opens now paradise to us. And I think that, um, you know, always remembering that we're in the midst of that whole procession mm-hmm. back towards the Garden of Eden. Um, and on a practical thing, I know Teresa Cotter had asked a question about the liturgy. Sometimes I like, or I used to like as a, as a layman, when I was standing among the people, when, when God's people are singing the liturgy, sometimes to stop for a moment and allow the whole movement of the liturgy to carry me along, like the paralytic being carried to the foot of Christ. You know, mm-hmm. the, the voice that we give in the liturgies, that is the voice of the angels singing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And they're to our right and to our left. And sometimes we need to stop and allow that movement, the power of the liturgy to carry us there. Yeah. I might even add as well, I mean, in, in the old days, churches were built to remind us of heaven. I mean, mm-hmm. they'd look like they looked for, they didn't look like other buildings because they weren't supposed to. And um, we just sort of turned them into meeting halls now. Uh, and I think we're getting back to our tradition. So the newest church architecture, I think, is returning. But I will say that my own parish, I mean, is, is, is intentionally meant to remind you of heaven. You know, the, the, as the starry skies up above the, the firmament, uh, the altar at the center and the, the holy place and the tabernacle and the holy of holies and, and so on. So um, at some point, you know, we have to, I think, uh, get back also just to realize that it, it's a whole concept. Of, you know, just re- building our churches so that people are reminded I'm being transported to heaven in this liturgy, in this holy place. I can't wait to show everybody the church I'm designing right now. Oh, it's really? cosmic. <laughs> Maybe I'll send you a link, Angela, to the uh, virtual tour of my church. Nice, yeah. Not really finished it, but you'll get a sense of the beauty and the magnificence of it. Yeah. Wonderful. That would be great. Um, I think we only have time probably for one, maybe two more questions. Um, uh, one person was wondering if our guardian angels stay with us after bodily death. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in fact, we're going to talk about that next week, uh, the angels and death, uh, how the angels escort us. <laughs> we have that in the, in the Roman liturgy, may, may choirs of angels uh, escort you into paradise, you see. Um, and so uh, our guardian angel goes up with us uh, to the gates and, and to the judgment seat. And uh, it's a be- there are many beautiful things that, that you'll, you'll hear about that next week. Okay. So I'll, I'll reserve, yeah. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, I think there are a couple of people all touching on a common theme of trying to understand uh, angels going to and from heaven and being present at the same time with us. Can you explain further? Well, angels travel the speed of thought. So in other words, it's almost instantaneous in such a sense that, not that they're literally two places at once, um, the, but rather that, uh, that they are, um, um, you know, they're, 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 you know but, but it's so quick as to be practically that. So for example, I, I remember in 1968, I was on the black sand beach of Hawaii and that I can, I'm right there now, you know, I, I see that beach and I'm there, you know, and that's where I think this coming and going doesn't, you know, take all this time. It, it, it's, it's sort of uh, quite instant. And also the idea, uh, again, that I mentioned earlier is that the, as the fathers of the church remind and the source and corda, all these things remind us that it's not so much that heaven comes down to us, but rather we're, we, we're brought up there. So we're all in one place together in a certain sense with the liturgy as well. All right. So, but angels don't need to take time to get somewhere. You know, the idea of their wings, they don't literally have wings, right? But, but they, they, their, their wings indicate, first of all, their modesty. They cover aspects of themselves, veil their faces. 
uh, to the presence and so on. But likewise, it indicates their swiftness and their speed, but in an allegorical, not a literal way. They don't literally fly like birds. Thank you, Monsignor. Yeah. Thank you, Monsignor, for, for uh, being with us tonight and all the great questions coming in. I know there were a lot of questions we couldn't get to. We'll try to handle some in the uh, pregame uh, discussion next week. And um, um, for those that want to hang around, you're more than welcome to do so. I, Monsignor is mentioning the Liturgy of St. John Chrysostom earlier. Um, so I went and grabbed my, my, uh, my book here and be happy to read you the short piece on, of the preface and Eucharistic prayer, which mentions the angels you were talking about, Monsignor. I'd Good. also encourage you to go back and read the Roman canon um, and the prayers, the prefaces and things uh, for that. So, uh, because that kind of gets back into the, uh, into the beautiful tradition that Monsignor was talking about and, uh, and to use that as your prayer uh, and to make it your own. Okay. So uh, thank Good. you again, Monsignor, for being with us tonight. Yeah. Well, could you maybe read that as a closing prayer? Yeah, well, you can. Sure. I mean, you guys stay around as you like, and I'll go ahead and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sing it because I, I can't read. I'm not used to reading it. Okay. I only know how to sing it. So. Good. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, it's, a, it's simply chanted, but um, okay. Blessed is our God at all times, both now and ever and unto ages of ages. Amen. It is fitting and right to sing to you, to bless you, to praise you, to give thanks to you, to worship you in every place of your dominion. For you are God beyond description, beyond understanding, invisible, incomprehensible, always existing, always the same. You and your only begotten Son and your all Holy Spirit, out of nothing you brought us into being, and when we had fallen, raised us up again. And you have not ceased doing everything until you brought us to heaven and graciously gave us your future kingdom. For all these things, we thank you and your only begotten Son and your all Holy Spirit for all these blessings, both known and unknown, manifest and hidden that were lavished upon us. Mm. We thank you also for this liturgy, which you are pleased to accept from our hands. Though there stand before you thousands of archangels, a myriad of angels, cherubim and seraphim, six-winged, many-eyed, soaring aloft on their pinions, singing, proclaiming, shouting the hymn of victory and saying, Holy, 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 Lord of hosts, heaven and earth are filled with your glory, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. With these blessed powers, O Master, who love mankind, we too cry out and say, Holy are you and all holy, you and your only begotten Son and your all holy spirit. Holy are you in all holy and magnificent is your glory, who so loved your world as to give your only begotten Son, that everyone who believes in him shall not perish, but may have life everlasting. When he had come and fulfilled all that was appointed him to do for our sake, on the night on which he was delivered up, or rather delivered himself up for the life of the world, taking bread in his holy, spotless, and blameless hands, giving thanks and blessing and sanctifying and breaking it, gave it to his holy disciples and apostles and said, and the liturgy goes on with the consecration yeah. and so forth. Very mm -hmm. interesting. The, uh, just after it is a hymn to the mother of God. It's back to one of our questions we had about, about the elevation of our human nature because of the incarnation. This is what it says about the mother of God. <coughs> it is fitting and right to call you blessed, O Theotokos, O Mother of God, you are ever blessed and all blameless and the Mother of our God, higher in honor than the cherubim, more glorious without compare than the seraphim. Mm -hmm. You gave birth to God, the word in virginity. You are truly the Mother of God. You do we exalt. Mm 